No, no. We just violated one of the big protocols in class, but that's okay. Uh, so it hadn't said more than about two sentences. They're kind of long sentences. But, okay, so one thing we can't do in this class is that we can't violate privacy. Okay? The privacy laws. I think they go a little too far, but you know, it's hard to say where the balancing point is. I could be wrong about that. But it's inconvenient because if somebody talks during class, I can't use the video, which means there's a whole day where the video is going to be missing because I can't do them over. Uh, first place, if I do a video without an audience, they suck. Uh, even worse than the ones I make with an audience. Um, in the second place, uh, well, that's pretty much it. Sometimes I can edit, but uh, if there's more than one interruption, if, if there's one interruption, it takes me 15 minutes to edit. If there are two interruptions, I am going to take the time. If there's one interruption, I might not take the time, depending on what else I have to do. So we don't walk in front of the camera, and we don't make audible noises or do anything else that can identify us. No, doesn't mean we can't talk to her class. All you gotta do is raise your hand or throw something at me if I'm not looking, you know, whatever it takes, okay? And I can walk over and press a little button and pause the video and then we can go on, okay? Uh, so, uh, with that caveat, uh, make sure we understand that. If you're not here, you better be watching this video. If you're in my class before, you kind of know that much. Uh, and and uh, so forth. Now, uh, the other question is, uh, everybody here, one person, uh, <laughs> it's a small class. Uh, then again, <laughs> we have some real weather issues going on. Uh, we missed the first two days of the semester. Today we're on a slow schedule, so we have an abbreviated class. Uh, have you seen the Canvas announcement? Okay, and you gotta go to Canvas. You know where Canvas is? You know how to get there? Don't bother now, just do what it says. You have to get materials from the bookstore. And you have to, you got those? Okay, well, see that's start. But you have to look at Canvas. Now, if you, if you know to get the materials, you haven't really haven't missed anything. Uh, and it's probably the only time we're going to use Canvas because Canvas is something that isn't very useful to me in this course or to us in this course. They don't allow me to set the grade book up the way it needs to be set up. It has to be set up for their model. And there's no way around it. Now, there are crazy things you can do to make some adjustments, but it never works. It never works the way it ought to. Uh, so, uh, and, and you don't email me through Canvas. Now, if you do, I'll get the email and I'll respond. And then I'll say, what part of my response is, don't email me through Canvas, okay? Uh, if you send me an attachment through Canvas, it's a royal pain to open it. Whereas if you send me an attachment from your VCCS email address, which is the official address used for this course, I just click and it opens, okay? And I probably won't open it. Because among other things, I keep track of those attachments and I can't keep track of anything that's sent to me through Canvas. It's, yeah, there might be a way, but nobody's been able to tell me we have some real experts in it. If you haven't asked the question, right? Kind of like prompt engineering, you know what I'm talking about? Chat, GPT and stuff know how to ask the right questions and you know it's 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 useful stuff I'll be talking about it but you're not required to use it by any means. Um okay uh so anyhow there it is uh quick synopsis I'll read the syllabus and we'll go over it next time when everybody's here. Okay or when those who aren't here don't have an excuse anymore <laughs> and they're on their own as far as reading the syllabus. People I've had before know what's in it. Uh, <clears throat> very similar to what we've done before. Okay. Uh, the primary grade in this course is going to come from best. Okay. Probably 90% of your grade. There's also homework and quizzes, which is probably 10%, maybe 15, depending. I don't remember myself how I finally ended up setting it up because I went and revised everything after we missed the first couple of days. Don't remember all the decisions I made. 
I've got like seven syllabi to edit. Um, and and um, I didn't know until last night that we were even having class today. So um, that was right either way. But go on. And I haven't set up the schedule of assignments. Can't really do that until you know when the course starts. Okay, I'll, I'll be able to do that rel relatively quickly, but it's pretty much set up. Actually, I think I've pretty much done this one. Um, the uh, homework, uh, it's real easy to get everything right on the homework because you can probably find it somewhere on the internet. So I'll spot you that much if you want to do your homework that way, but you're not going to learn anything. And the tests, which are 90%, you know, not, not so much in this course where people actually have the uh, uh, maturity and educational experience to know better, and I'm sure you do, uh, but you, you just don't want to use a lot of help when you're doing the homework. You want to read the material, look at the examples, learn it, and then try to do the homework without looking at any of that. You're probably going to end up looking back. You're probably going to end up looking back at the day. Okay, so an example. Look something like this. Let's look back. Okay. Oh, we did something like this in class. I took notes. Let's see. Oh, I can't find my notes. Didn't write them down coherently. Uh, let's look at the video. No, that takes too long. Let's look at the text. <laughs> okay. You get into that, that sort of thing. And use your own judgment. Yeah. I'm not wedded to doing my videos, but what we do in class is largely I pose problems, you solve them, I pause the video while you solve them. I walk around, let's see what you're doing, give you maybe a few pointers, get up here, and after I've identified that everybody's doing it right, I just do it real quickly. Okay. Or if you've been making mistakes on it, I talk about pitfalls and how you do need to think about things. And we just go through the course, and that's what we do. All right. Uh, at least that's the plan. Uh, as the class evolves, as I get the interaction with the class, I can teach this course in a thousand different ways. I've taught this course more closer to 100 times than 50. Okay. Uh, and I teach it differently every time. Uh, it's convenient. Now that I'm approaching middle age, uh, <laughs> Uh, I find that I actually forget things that I did a year ago. Never used to. Okay. Uh, so I kind of sit down. I never, never look at the text and just rethink the course every semester. And I'm only teaching it once a year. I used to teach it three times a year. Uh, but I'm not teaching, teaching a lot of distance courses anymore. That was three times a year. Sometimes it's a four because I was teaching one in class. Uh, uh, now, uh, I approach it a little bit differently. So it's always going to be a little different. So you kind of see how that evolves. Uh, if it turns out I can't pull that off in one of these years, that's going to be the case. Then I start looking at the textbook. <laughs> I go by the textbook. Uh, better that I stay in touch with what the class is doing and respond to it. You know, I say, here it is. Good luck. Okay. So at this point, that's a little bit about my approach. You can learn that as we go. Um, there are other things you, you should know. Read the syllabus. And we will go over it next time but we're not gonna take time on a shortened class today when nobody's here. Now, actually all the important people here, obviously. Uh, no, when, when three quarters of the class isn't here, uh, it, it, it would be a disservice and it'd be ridiculous. And uh, it's nobody's fault, that's the weather. I don't disagree with the decisions that have been made with the weather. Uh, I probably would have made the same ones. Um, but we got to get started. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to ask you this. 
Can you draw a perfect circle like I did? Well, it's not perfect. And I'm not sure I'm going to find the center. But there's actually, it's one of my better efforts. But it's now looking at it from this angle. This side looked as big as this side, but I didn't cut it right. Okay. I didn't cut it at the low point. It's lopsided down here. It's still a reasonable representation of the circle. Okay. Here's an angle theta. This is a unit circle. You know what a unit circle is? You seen that terminology before? It's a circle of radius one. Can you show me the cosine and the sine of that angle? Now, if you're watching the video, go ahead. If you want, if you're in class, go ahead. But if you're watching the video, this is where you stop the video and do what I said. Don't sit back in passive TV watching mode. Engage. I'm not sure where they got all the details, but what you said was correctly the vertical distance and the horizontal distance and which is which and all that. Here's your picture. Uh, in this picture, you've always got enough. Okay, you understand. Okay, and if you don't understand and you're in this course, you're going to have to go back to pre calculus and look it up because I'm not going to explain it. Okay, I shouldn't have to explain this. And I, no, I don't have to with students. Uh, if you really don't know, yeah, go ahead and email me or ask me after class. I'll give you a little explanation. But you've got to be better off if you just look it up if you need to. It's your definitions of sine and cosine. It's a standard picture. It's one you've always got to keep in mind. Now, uh, let me ask you this. What's theta here? What's theta if your line is up here? What's theta here? What's theta here? And what's theta if you come all the way around here? Well, what I saw, what I typically see, I'm not going to say necessarily what the one person here, yeah, because that kind of identifies your work. Uh, that's kind of safe. Eight equals 90 is not safe. Eight equals 180 isn't safe. Eight equals 270 isn't safe. And eight equals 360 isn't safe because you haven't specified the units of your numbers. Okay? Now, I'm not saying whether you did or not, but typically, Engineers don't put degrees on their angles, which is potentially a fatal mistake. Now, zero was okay without the degrees, but we don't use degrees when we do calculus. Okay. So how are we going to label these angles in a universally defined system? Recording. Okay, so we need degrees if we're going to put two angles in degrees. Two angles in radians, we don't need degrees. So theta equals zero means zero radians. It doesn't mean zero degrees. It means zero radians. If you want zero degrees, you write zero attainable degrees. <laughs> okay. 90 degrees, okay. Theta equals pi over two radians is optional because that is the default unit of angle in mathematics, okay? Engineers don't seem to want to understand that. Don't know if you're going to be an engineer, but most people in this course are in the engineering curriculum. I uh, haven't asked you that, okay? Theta equals 360 degrees or three pi. Radians is optional. Okay. Well, we've got to build on this a little bit. We don't want to talk about elementary pre-calculus because that's all this is. Okay. And it's fundamental knowledge. So when you ask, oh, what's the cosine of pi over two? You should know immediately 
he might not memorize it. Is it zero or is it one? I know it's one of those. Which one is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, that means you're up here. It means you have zero x coordinate. Okay. So this picture allows you to quickly avoid that confusion. So that's what that's one one of the big reasons you want this picture. <clears throat> then you got you know pi over four and pi over six and two two pi over, pi over three two pi over all that stuff multiples of pi over three pi over four. And you can write exact expressions for all those sines and cosines. And we will use those exact expressions and that's the new way it is. And how to derive it. Okay, for example. This is pi over six. It means this is half a nuclear triangle. If this is one, it means this is one half. By the Pythagorean theorem, it means this is the square root of three over two. There's your cosine, there's your sine. Okay, you should be able to do that with any of the pi over two, well, not pi over two, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three. Okay, use basic geometric geometry with Pythagorean theorem, set it up, and get it. Um, it's just something you got to know because it comes up again and again. Those angles come up again and again. You don't want to have to stop. You don't have to punch a calculator. You don't want to have to Google it. You got to know. Okay. Well, now that you know it, I'm going to give you a set of parametric equations. Where are all the points that satisfy these two equations? And I said, uh, I'm going to just rewrite the whole thing. So normally, I've got three classes in a row, and I've got time to stop and eat a little something between a couple of these classes so I don't run out of blood sugar. And I'm getting there. So that's no excuse. Put it out by x of t equals cosine t. Yeah, I'm getting there because I want to write sine of t. Split it y of t. Y of t equals sine t. Okay. What's a graph does that look like? Well, you're probably going to have to review parametric equations. It look a little dubious, but most people do at this point, even if they had calculus last spring and did this at the end of the course. Um, because we did differential equations in between the end of calculus and this. Some of the stuff that you don't use much in differential equations tend to slip away from. It's been a couple of years since you had the course. It really slips away, okay, if you haven't done a lot of it. Well, it's very simple. Now we could make a table, and I'm not going to do this. Because I can't seem to do it right. If t equals zero, you got the cosine of zero, which is zero. You got the sine of zero, which you can see is one. Hey guys, good heavens, everybody's here now. Okay, well, we're two thirds of the way through class. Um, hang on. Yeah, no, it's fine. We don't talk while this is gone. Okay, because of privacy laws, I can't use the video if you talk. Okay. Um, okay, anyhow. Uh, so if you, if you need to ask a question or something, you know, signal me. Uh, if my back is turned, throw something hard at my head, and it might get my attention. Uh, don't take that too seriously. Uh, okay, so really, the only mathematical stuff we've talked about, and you can look at the first part. We talked a little bit about the course with the video, which will be posted hopefully later today. Um,
just talking about the unit circle, sine and cosine. So, you know, I asked people, okay, first of all, I draw all of this without any of the labels, just with the angle, what's the sine, what's the cosine? You should know that the cosine is this, the sine is this. You should know that these angles in degrees are zero, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees. If you're an engineering student, you're probably immune to putting the degree on the angle, which is going to lead you to trouble someday. Okay? Because it's, you know, if, if you do a calculation in degrees and calculus, it's going to be wrong. Unless you happen to have zero. Okay? Uh, you got to use radians, and you don't have to write units after radians, because those are the default units in mathematics. Degrees are not the default unit, even though they're the first one you learn. And 360 degrees divides up really nicely. So it's not a bad idea, but you got to put the degrees in angles. Okay. And I don't know why people keep forgetting that, unless they happen to be engineering students, because engineers never do it. Okay. Uh, and then they get into calculus and die. Uh, engineering students are doing real well in calculus this year. Okay. So, um, there we have it. There it is. Right there is how you derive the sine and cosine of pi over six. You should understand that picture. You should be able to draw that picture for any of the eight multiples of pi over six or pi over four. It's basic pre-calculus. Review it if you have to. You're going to want to have it. It's going to be in your way if you don't. Okay? Unless you've got a really good memory. But then you're memorizing something you don't understand. Why would you do that when it's easy to understand it? Okay? So you got to know those angles. Um, so now we're doing x of t equals cosine t, y of t equals sine t, t from zero to two pi. Can anybody tell me what that's going to look like? Can you make a picture like a parabola or a reciprocal function or an exponential function? Anything with your hands? Yeah, that's right. It's a circle. Why is it a circle? Well. It doesn't hurt to go back and make approximations here. Uh, the cosine of pi over 4 is the square root of 2 over 2. Uh, cosine of pi over 2 is 1. Cosine of pi is negative square root of 2 over 2, and so forth. The sine of pi over 4 is the square root of 2 over 2. Uh, the sine of pi is 0. Um, the sine of, and this is not supposed to be pi, this is supposed to be 3 pi over 4, uh, and the sine of pi over 4 is the square root of 2 over 2, and so forth. And you start plotting points, and you get points that are here, 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 and here. And if you continue this, the points go around the circle. And that's natural, because, of course, x is the cosine of theta here, and y is the sine of theta. Okay? So if you say cosine of t, it's like, okay, t is now your angle. Okay. And you do cosine of t and sine of t, you get the circle. Now, if you did, what, what, what do you think you'd have if you did two cosine t and sine t? What do you think your shape would be? Can you name it? No, I'm not going to illustrate this because this is reviewed as something that you should have had in calculus two. And if you didn't, uh, you're going to need to do some heavy review within the next week or so, as well as regular assignments, okay? I'm trying to give you an overview today. Um, now, there's there's a chapter, um, and let me just digress. Everybody knows what materials to use and stuff. Everybody been to a Canvas page? You can go to the Canvas page and make sure you've done what you need to do, or otherwise you won't be able to find the videos, okay? Now, if you have done that and still don't know where to do the videos, email me and I'll tell you. And I'll tell you why it was obvious, but I'm not going to manage. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll even send you a link, but you should be able to find it yourself. Okay. Because the instructions are really simple. If you just go to this site, you click on this thing, you bookmark it. Then you click where it says Map 265, and you bookmark that, and you've got it. it, it it's that simple. Okay. Uh, so...
So I even have a point out here where this is now where x equals two. So here's one, here's two. Here's your unit circle. Uh, when you get up to t equals pi over four, the sine is one, but the cosine is zero. And you're gonna go over here to negative two and down here to one, and you're gonna have a path does this. Make sense? Okay. Well, now we're going to do this. This is actually getting into the chapter that's coming up. Okay. Now we use the I vector and the J vector. We familiar with I vector and J vector? Is okay. I familiar with I vectors and J vectors. I vector is a unit vector in the x direction. J vector is a unit vector in the y direction. Vector of magnitude one. So if I multiply the I vector by whatever the value of x is, then it means I go in the x direction that far. And similar with the y. Okay. And Let's just say this is our basic cosine ti plus sine tj. Now, all this stuff I'm doing here, uh, you're going to see in more detail when you do the homework, and it's not, people don't find it difficult. So it's a little unfamiliar. Okay, but I'm just going to give you a picture and a picture of where we're heading and why we're doing it and what we're doing. Okay, as much of that as I can in the next. Uh, We've got to a quarter after 28 minutes. No, 23 minutes. Okay. So we might run over a little bit if you have time because people got confused because of all the compression classes. Uh, so, anyhow, we have this. Okay. So, let's see. If t equals zero, we got one i plus zero j, right? Well, one i means we go one unit in the x direction and no units in the y direction, so we have our t equals zero point, right? And if t equals pi over four, well, that means we go square root of two over two in this direction, square root of two over two in this direction, okay? And that takes us up to here, and this is where t equals pi over four. And if we continue, There's our t equals pi point and so forth. And we get the points on the unit circle. Okay. Now, let's do a little calculus. Can you write down what you think dr dt would be given that r of t is cosine ti plus sine tj? Okay, everybody seems to have an opinion, not everybody's done writing. But okay, I'm gonna write out what this is, derivative with respect to T of cosine Ti plus sine Tj. Well, derivative distributes over addition. So that means we have the derivative A cosine t, i is a vector, but it's just a constant. So comes out of the calculation. We have this. Okay. There it is. Yeah. Check the video if you need to. Okay. Make sense? Well, what this tells us, here's your circle again. Oh man, that's bad, but anyhow.
right here is negative sine t i. Well, this is the t equals zero point. This vector is Well, I'm going to call this V of T because it's actually, if T is interpreted as time, this is your velocity. There's a magnitude and direction of your velocity. Zero I plus one J. Okay, if we go here. It's negative cosine T I plus sine T J. Now I haven't got room to do a lot of labeling. I'm probably just going to label this one and leave the rest to your imagination. But um, this vector is going to be V of pi over four equals negative square root of two over two I plus the square root of two over two J. I'm sorry if that's written a little bit sloppily. Uh, for a quick review, that's what we're doing. Okay, sorry. Uh, and that's got to be tangent to the circle because of course this vector is just square root of two over two I plus the square root of two over two J. The dot product of these vectors is zero. How many know what dot product is? We're going to do that, so if you don't know that's pre-calculus, but nobody ever seems to remember that. Uh, if you had linear algebra, you had linear algebra? You're in it now, okay? Yeah, well, you've got to see an I and J vectors, quite a bit of them, pretty soon. Okay, so you've got to get plenty of reinforcement of this. Um, all right, anyhow, you can easily prove that this vector is perpendicular to this if it's not obvious. The vector from here to here would have equal I and J components and this one has equal and opposite I and J components, which means that the slope of this is the negative reciprocal of the slope of this one, which means that they're perpendicular. And in many ways, you can prove that these vectors are perpendicular. Okay, well, if you continue that around the circle, you have tangent vectors all the way around the circle. They all have the same length, whether I'm actually drawing them that way or not. And those are your velocity vectors. Okay. And you get those velocity vectors from the derivative, and it's very easy to prove these properties. You even have an acceleration vector. Acceleration is a derivative of velocity. How many of you have physics? Okay. Yeah, well, even if you had high school physics. Any? Yeah, okay. You should know that acceleration is a rate of change of velocity. If you don't, um, look it up, Google it, whatever, okay? It's just a basic concept. We're not gonna And the rate of change is the derivative of. That's what a derivative is. It's a rate of change. That's its fundamental definition. And it's trivial to take that derivative. Again, if you're a little rusty, that's that, that's okay. Uh, you get that rust out very quickly. It's negative cosine ti plus sine tj. And notice that this is equal and opposite to this. So you have your acceleration vectors. I'll use colors. So that vector is at every point at least at the points that we can verify, it's a vector toward the origin. And for these functions, it's a unit vector toward the origin. Make sense? Okay. Now, what if we do a different R2?
cosine of t squared i plus the sine of t squared j. What's the derivative of that? See if you do that in the next few seconds. Okay, I'll be maybe leaving the two off of the derivative of t squared. People did pretty well here. Okay, you understand it's a chain rule. And that's good. I'm happy with that. Get the rest of the rust out, as you certainly will when you do some more problems. Okay, simple enough. And this is then going to be Well, this should be a cosine here. You see it getting a little long in subsequent derivatives if you were going to use them, and we pretty much won't. But sometimes the next derivative is important. Um, instead of acceleration, you call that jerk, but that doesn't matter. Okay, now you get something like this, right? So if you were to do the picture, let's see if I really get this line in the center. I always do it a little too far to the left. That's not great. Um, Okay, t equals zero, you're here. Come on. Included 1.2 to 1.3, and that's going to be uh, something's wrong. Over two, yeah. Now, three halves of pi is maybe about four and a half, and square of that is about 2.2. It's three pi over two. Oh. Uh, Point two is obviously not right. I don't think I have the numbers right again. Okay, if you look at these numbers, take these square roots and do it right like I didn't. Now you get something like 0 0.9, 1 1.2, 1 1.4, 1 1.8. I'm going to fudge and call that 1.5. And that might even be right. You see that the time interval between these points is decreasing, which means that you're moving faster and faster. Well, what's driving your motion? It's the square of time. And if you square numbers, square increasingly big numbers with an equal interval between them, the intervals of the square get bigger and bigger. And I'm not studying that very well because I haven't eaten anything in a while. Okay. Now, if you look at the velocities, you still have a multiple of the sine of t squared. And this looks a whole lot like what you had before, except you got the two here 
and it should be two to t. Okay. So when you're at this point, your speed is 2t because this is a unit vector. The sine and the square of the sine and the cosine add up to one. This is always a unit vector here, but this vector keeps getting bigger and bigger. And that's something that's worth looking back at and thinking about. So you have zero velocity here. You have a somewhat bigger velocity here, then a bigger one here, then a bigger one here. And a bigger one here. Okay. Which means your change in velocity is not just toward the center, it is toward the center because this vector is moved in this direction. This vector from here to here, it's like it's rotated in this direction. That causes it to have a component toward the center, but it also gets bigger, which means there's a forward component to it. It means your acceleration vectors, which I drew in green before, now are not quite toward the center, um, even less toward the center. Uh, and so if I don't even want to try to draw them because I'm not thinking as clearly as I'd like, uh, and acceleration get vectors get bigger. The point is that there's a component of the acceleration that's parallel to the velocity and a component that's perpendicular to the velocity. Okay. The velocity is always along the tangent to the curve because that's the direction you're moving at any instant. So what you get is I'm just going to call this a parallel. That's this vector. And then I don't usually draw here. You have a vector perpendicular to your position vector. Okay. So your acceleration has a component in the direction of the position vector and a direct component in the direction of the velocity vector. And you can easily find that using dot product and a few things that will develop rather quickly here, like early next week. Okay. Um, okay. So at this point, you have at least a preliminary picture of how you analyze motion if you're given the parametric equations. Now, I haven't used the words, but X of T and Y of T give you a set of parametric equations, okay? And it's not always a sine and a cosine, although it often is. Sometimes it's an ellipse. Okay, sometimes you're moving with a constant angular velocity on the ellipse, which means you're moving faster here than you are here, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, well, you analyze that. And it's not particularly difficult, okay? Calculations are not difficult, but you want to get the concepts. now. Other thing about this course is we move into three dimensions. So I'm going to quickly illustrate. This unit circle. Maybe it's cosine of ti plus sine tj. So moving around it in the counterclockwise direction. Okay. And of course, this is x and this is y and this is z. And all these are mutually perpendicular. All the angles are right angles between the axes. Okay. Now you're going to get real used to that in linear algebra. Okay. And if you aren't already. Okay. So. We also have z of t, which is t. Now, when t equals zero, cosine is one, sine is zero. So one unit in the direction of the i vector, no units in the direction of the y vector, the j vector, and one unit in the direction of the z vector. 
I'm sorry, no units in the direction of Z vector. So t equals zero, we have a point here. Okay, well, at t equals pi over two, the cosine is one, the sine is zero, so it moves us out to the point here, the i and j, the, the x and y components are here. The z component is t, which means we're one unit above. So we're at, like at a point here, okay? Now at t equals pi, well, here's your t equals pi over two point. t equals pi, well, in the xy plane, we're here, that's easy to see. And we've got to do be two units high, so we've got to be all the way up here, okay? Because z is now, when I say two units high, it's more than two units high. No, it is, it's two, okay. Out here, we're even higher. Okay, so we go all the way up to here. And when we get here, we go all the way up to maybe here. So we're following a path. It starts here, goes to here, comes up here, comes around here, and then somehow twists around and gets up here. I didn't draw that very well. It would look more from our perspective here. It's a helix. It's like a threads of a screw. Okay. Now, if you replace t by t squared, then it's still a helix because you're still on the unit circle because x squared plus y squared is still going to be one. You're still going to be in the unit circle, but z of t is going to change faster and faster. It's just like you're going up this staircase that gets really steep really fast. That makes sense. If you got those pictures, that's a good start. And you want to think about them because the more you've thought about them when we actually start doing the stuff, which we'll go through pretty quickly because it's actually pretty easy. Uh, you'd probably be happy about it. Uh, now, in this course, there's stuff that's fairly easy. The stuff that I've outlined here is kind of where we start. It's fairly easy. You do have to understand parametric equations. I will talk about that in some detail on Tuesday. Not for long, but in some detail. I'll go through it pretty fast. But if you play the video back, you get it. And if you go to other resources on the web, you can also get it. Okay, There are plenty of places you can get the information. Uh, we go pretty fast through the easy stuff so that when we get to the hard stuff, which at the end of the course is really hard, but it's fundamentals of how calculus is used in most engineering. Okay, fundamental to a lot of engineering. Um, then we have time to solve it. Okay, uh, so, okay.